Great. Well, it's 10 o'clock. Let's go. Okay. Welcome, everybody, to the, uh, the Emotional Intelligence Training Company's webinar, Coaching with Emotional Intelligence. I'm David Corey. I'm here with uh, uh, one of my business associates, <laughs> uh, Jill Corey. Happy to share the same last name. Uh, and, um, and we're excited to talk to you about coaching with emotional intelligence today. So we, we have a bit of a plan and um, uh, you know, we have a bit of an agenda for what we want to talk about, but, but we also want to hear from you. And so you know, use that chat box. So we're going to have that open on our screen at all times so we can check in with your comments and your questions uh, throughout. And, and we'd love for you to, to just sort of, if you have a question, you know, don't hold back or a comment just type it into the chat box and we'll follow along there. Okay, uh, so anything you want to add, Jill? No, that's going? good. Just welcome to the morning. Okay. All right, so, so let's, uh, let's take a look at, uh, at, at a quotation. You know, this is a great quotation and uh, uh, it, it's, it's really, it really speaks to the reasons why we might want to be uh, interested in this idea of coaching and the connection with leadership. Um, Jill, do you want to read it? You found it. <laughs> I found it. You read it. Yeah. Well, I think we'll just highlight some important aspects of it, which is the, the, you know, our new thinking, of course, around leadership, which is to influence rather than use our authority or power. So then we ask ourselves, what are the skills that we need that would influence or bring people along with us? Um, so coaching has been in the last decade an important tool for bringing people along and making sure that they're not just influenced by our thinking, but connected with not only the leaders thinking about the organizational mission and values. Um, emotional intelligence is foundational for, for those kinds of connections, um, which also includes effective communication, building collaboration, et cetera. So that's really what we're gonna talk about. And I think these days we also understand that these set of skills are essential for ensuring that you have employee and customer engagement, collaboration, teamwork, innovation, and overall organizational excellence. We've worked with lots of organizations who say emotional intelligence is a differentiating factor between a good and a great organization. And I think they're talking about this whole set of skills or competencies that, and some of which we'll get a chance to talk about a bit today. Yeah. Thanks, Jill. Uh, and in brief, you know, we're, we're transitioning from an old way of operating, where you know I just need to tell you what to do and you do you do it that wouldn't work. Why well. you looking at me? <laughs> <laughs> that wouldn't work well in, in our relationship, uh, and neither does it work well in terms of relationships in the workplace. So we go, oh God, we got to stop telling people what to do, uh, and and start building relationships, communicate, communicating, connecting, etc. The things we're going to be talking about, which today. we hear from organizations all the time, that that's their interest and. Um, that's where organizations are going and the mm -hmm. successful ones certainly have incorporated or just wholly bought into. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, so what we're going to talk about is uh, what we mean by coaching. Uh, you, you'll hear people talk about coaching and they say, oh, coaching, we do that all the time. And we find out that they actually don't really know much about coaching. They think that what they're doing is coaching. And so... Well, and often it's conflated with performance management, yes. and sometimes that, that's a component of it, but um, I think sometimes it's, re it's a replacement for managing performance yeah. issues at work. And so, and we're going to just share a perspective. Obviously, there is um, an infinite amount of conversation these days on coaching, and so we're just going to share a quick perspective on where we're thinking what we're thinking about today and how it's connected to EI. Absolutely. And, and we are the emotional intelligence training company. So th that's why we want to talk about the E, the emotional intelligence competencies that, that really underscore coaching mm -hmm. and provide the foundation for coaching. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and then there's this last one, um, connecting with heart. Uh, it's such an interesting question and idea. Uh, and so, so we'll talk a little bit about that. What do we mean by that? It's, mm -hmm. It sounds kind of weird in the workplace. And we, and we, we hear frequently from managers, uh, you know, uh, we, we don't, we don't uh, talk much about emotions here. You know, we're, uh, we're a technical organization or, you know, we're, uh, this is what we do. Um, Bottom line organization. Yeah. 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 We're, or we're a sales organization or, uh, 
uh, or we're a healthcare organization or whatever it is, but, but this idea of, uh, of connecting with heart, it sounds a little bit airy fairy and a little bit, uh, or like the guys who said, you know, we don't do touchy feely. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. We were like, good. You know, <laughs> we don't know. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> and you shouldn't. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, uh, so we'll talk a little bit about this notion of connecting with heart because it's critical and it's important and uh, uh, and there's some really great reasons to do it and, and look for and uh, to, um, uh, to to consider it and think about it. Uh, all right, so here we've got. Um, uh, we've got this idea that we we both just really liked this quotation. Again, Jill, you found it. Uh, it why don't you read it for us? <laughs> Finders, readers. <laughs> the most basic and powerful way to connect for to another person is to listen. And fundamentally, in coaching, that's what um, is required of us: is is a hard listen to the other person, not a light first level listening, but a hard listen. Um, perhaps the most th important thing we ever give to each other is our attention. And I think we all know in today's realities that our attention is divided in many, many ways and mistakes are made and relationships are sometimes harmed because we haven't been paying attention to the right thing at the right time. And that all requires discernment and enough attention given in the moment to make sure we are putting first things first in importance on the relationship. Yes. And the understanding that, that multitasking is a myth. You can't be working on your computer and listen to someone right. uh, talking to you at the same time. Okay. What do we mean by coaching? What is coaching? What do we mean by coaching? And uh, so, you know, uh, these are just, these are, are some thoughts on coaching. And, and if you Google definition of coaching, you'll get so many different definitions mm -hmm. and, and, and included in that. In fact, probably more pages will come up than any other are for sports coaching. So right. people think that, that, that um, people get confused by that. So coaching in the workplace is, you know, are you standing on the sidelines? Are you calling plays? Are you, right. uh, you know, are, are you coaching like you would in sports coaching? But we're really talking about something quite different. Uh, and um, so it, it's an approach. Uh, to building relationships, developing, pe developing pe people in service of creating a trusting, honoring, respectful, creative culture. Uh, so there's some powerful, powerful ideas just in that first mm -hmm. sentence. Mm -hmm. Of course, the goal in coaching is empowerment. Um, in a more authoritative <laughs> model or a, a hierarchical model, the goal is not empowerment. The goal is to maintain power at the top in a coaching approach. So we, we differentiate a coach approach, which is built into every interaction in our, in our lives and workplaces versus coaching um, in a more formal way. So we mean both by that, but the intention is always empowerment, both of each individual and the relationship. And so that's a stand that we take that believes that people have their own answers and, and they need help sometimes getting out of the box that they're thinking in or um, new information or people asking important questions to help them think outside of their habit. Um, but the goal is what's important here, which is the empowerment goal versus maintaining power at the top and making demands down on people mm -hmm. that, with a set of punitive rather than um, like positively supporting people to develop. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and coaching is a set of skills. Uh, we, we have all, everyone in our, com our company has done their training at the Coactive Institute. Uh, uh, and the Coactive Training Institute uh, was formerly the Coaches Training Institute, now the Coactive Training Institute, a fantastic, fantastic organization that, that provides fantastic training. Uh, and, um, and, and this set of skills, which can be practiced, developed, and harnessed to enhance your, your overall leadership. And really one of the big changes with, at the Coaches Training Institute was this big interest and focus on leadership. And so, uh, so they, um, they, they have really uh, you know, decided to embrace the connection with leadership and the, the way that coaching does such a great job of, uh, of helping leaders to understand that this there is a way to to interact with employees that is much more empowering for employees offers much more respect and uh, that and they actually know stuff yes 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 yeah yeah. yeah yeah and by leadership we mean formal leadership but we also mean self-leadership um, mm -hmm. personal leadership so and I think sort of CTI practice from that perspective so it's also about just how do we in our own lives uh, be our own leaders mm -hmm. 
And finally, the notion that um, we're focused on the person, not the problem. So again, it's related to that the comment I made earlier about performance management. This is not about um, necessarily intervening in a problem and managing the person to manage a problem. It's really focused on understanding, for example, where there's a problem, understanding the person's thinking about it, and then helping that person kind of come to uh, either a new perspective on it or a, a way to kind of rehabilitate the problem, not the person. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and this idea that if you treat your employees well, they'll treat your customers well. Well, if you, uh, if you, uh, you know, respect your employees and, and treat them in, in this, the way that we're talking about with respect to coaching, they, they'll figure out their own problems. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what we want. Um, they'll figure out their own problems and solutions. Well, <laughs> they'll figure out their, their own, they'll find solutions to their own problems. How about that? <laughs> Uh, and and this connection with emotional intelligence uh, again uh, you know we that this is our specialty area this 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 whole area of emotional intelligence and uh, again if you google emotional intelligence like coaching you get all kinds of different perspectives and different ideas about what it is and how it operates and and, and really the, the the most important thing is to find a model that's useful uh, and we think that this model of uh, 15 um, emotional intelligence skills is so helpful for people to, you know, um, understand why they do what they do, how they do what they do, and, and to see whether adjustments can be made so that they can do, do things more effectively in terms of what they need to do uh, for leadership, for uh, navigating their life, their, their jobs and, the, and their lives. Mm -hmm. uh, and we've, we've just finished a project where there was about 100 managers and we, we did all their debriefs, high, level senior, high level senior leaders, very unique organization. And so, um, so we can't help but look at the model and immediately have all these leaders come to mind. And, and, and we've had uh, such an interesting experience working with this organization uh, and learning about how the model works in yet more unique and interesting mm -hmm. in different ways because mm -hmm. it's always so different. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things just to always we want to and like to point out with the model that um, we have again in our own habits or in our own ways that we function or operate tend to lean on certain of these competencies over others. I am a person who's emotionally self-aware and self-expressive and have a lot of empathy. And so those, those I would score very high on. Um, and then there's others, well, you know, cause I like wine and <laughs> Netflix, I spoke lower on impulse control. And so part of what we're trying to do is not look at each individual skill, but also the whole picture to see where are our go-to competencies and are they getting in the way of functioning or are they supporting my work in my life? But also what else might I call on to develop a bigger range of ways to operate? And, and have more tools to call on depending on the circumstances and relationships. Yeah. So this gives people a really full picture of their kind of their operating system um, and, and points to potentially too low or too high scores, for, you know, for example, self-regard. Um, we used to be a bit more worried when people scored low on self-regard, but these days, particularly in this organization that was primarily men who didn't, score really high on self-regard but it's because they were humble and leaders from behind kind of perspective and so we we don't want to problematize necessarily a low score um, sometimes it is sometimes it gets in the way of being able to take a stand in as, as a leader similarly a too high score in self-regard might point to or indicate somebody who's a bit arrogant and untouchable or bulletproof um, in terms of being in relation with others so that's for us the nuances of the interest in, in the in these 15 competencies just see how they are individually and connected to and, and, I, and I like how you, how you came out with a new question what would you, what would you think of someone who scored 130 on self-regard yeah exactly <laughs> yeah 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 now, and, and again and, and not that that's bad scoring mm -hmm. 130 on mm -hmm. self-regard but but if it's if it's over relied upon if, if people mm -hmm. if that's their go-to competency and and in a way it, it is for me and I have to watch it I have to be careful of it I mean I have a high score on self-regard and a high score on optimism and sometimes those things just <laughs> aren't always you know centered grounded um, rooted in you know reality mm -hmm. and, and yeah and you point 
point to there as well. Um, with high self-regard, you want to see particularly a high empathy level so that you're thinking both about yourself and others in a balanced way. Yes. And that would be strong leadership. Yeah, yeah. And um, also pointing to high optimism, you'd like that to be balanced with high reality testing, <laughs> which combined, we do that, but individually not so well. <laughs> Yeah, people are people are partnered with each other for a reason, and uh, and and it's nice to balance each other off in, in certain ways. Okay, so so should we talk about the leadership model? Sure. Okay, yeah. so so we also have this leadership model, and uh, and the publishing company MHS uh, that, that publishes the EQI has done a great uh, uh, has done a, a great job of combining a leadership model. This is the leadership model that's used. It's called the, uh, the, the four, four dimension model of transformational leadership. Uh, and and we, so we, we have these areas that correlate with various EQ competencies from the EQI model. Uh, and, um, and there we have this beautiful dimension of coaching, which we're gonna talk more about. And, uh, and again, we, we, we really want systematic and uh, kind of more scientific ways of understanding this instead of just saying to someone, connect with heart. Because that's kind of vague and difficult to... We have our own, what do we call it, like our woo meter? So yes, yes, yes. <laughs> we try to make sure that what we're doing has strong evidence and, and is actually going to be relevant and helpful in organizations. Yes. So trying to sift through what, it, what is founded in, in research and evidence, which is also action evidence, not just like academic research, yes. versus people's claims and differentiating again between people's opinions on something and, mm -hmm. and actually seeing it have some be often authenticated somehow there's mm -hmm. all kinds of approaches out there to understanding mm -hmm. human behavior to measuring and looking at human behavior and, uh, and and i guess we just really encourage people to to look at the research i mean what 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 is uh, you know how was it discovered is, is it just someone's idea and and not that someone's right. idea is bad but but you know companies want proven they want uh, they they want evidence based. They want best practices, and uh, and so that's that's again why we like this model. You know, over three decades of research have gone into the EQI, and uh, and so you know um, we have reasons to believe that that these things make a lot of sense and, and work. So so let's take a look at this this uh, this coaching um, dimension of transformational leadership. So what we've got. Uh, through that they found through a study was that that there these are the top six EQ competencies that correlate with this transformational leadership dimension of coaching mm -hmm. uh, and do um, uh, you want to talk a little bit about them Jill? Well we are going to go in more detail but the six here are self-actualization which is the only one of the uh, 15 competencies that shows up in each of the four leadership dimensions and their definition and, and we agree with it on self-actualization is not achievement, but living with purpose and meaning. Um, and so that, I think that sends us a message about how leadership is changing towards um, doing things that are meaningful and, and on purpose. So we're, we're not gonna talk so much about that one today, but if anybody has questions, we'll certainly talk, we can talk more about it. Empathy, we all know Brene Brown's work has had a big influence on people overall thinking about how empathy is important in the workplace. EQI has known that for 20 or 30 years. Um, reality testing, which is really, again, um, testing outside of our own biases. So the unconscious bias um, literature these days is raising, again, our own awareness of where we're in a box that we can't see outside of and how we make mistakes. It's, it's interesting, Jill, that so many people who come to us who are stuck Mm -hmm. are stuck in a perspective right right which right. If, if for the those of you who are cti mm -hmm. trained you'll know that that leads to what they call balance coaching uh and mm -hmm. and so mm -hmm. that that's to, that's all about reality testing mm -hmm. really yeah and, and even you know in that in that sense it's like where do i look for new ways of thinking about yes. the problem and a solution to the problem yeah um yeah so it's we i love yeah. reality testing yeah um interpersonal relationships again earlier comments about the importance of, of empowering relationships, relationships built on respect and trust, 
um, which you don't get in a more authoritative model. Assertiveness, being okay with asking for what you need, having difficult conversations, and emotional self-awareness, which, um, you know, it flies in the face of older thinking about leaving emotions at the door and that emotions don't have a place in the workplace. And I think those of you on the line are probably singing the same verses as we are in the choir, that, <laughs> that it's crucial. Yeah, absolutely. So, so let's take a look at a couple of these up close. And uh, we're going to start by, by taking a look at emotional self-awareness, just because it's kind of foundational. It's like, okay, so if you look at these six, where do you want to start? Uh, let's, go, let's go inward and start there and, and talk a little bit about the importance of emotional self-awareness. Uh, and, and again, this, this is, um, I think this is that uh, crucial part of the connection with heart. Mm -hmm. This has a lot to do with it right here. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, uh, and we, we, did, we did find, or, or, or we actually, I think we worked through as a team, didn't we? We yeah. sat, sat down mm -hmm. and, and our whole team, all of our coaches, we got around a big boardroom table uh, and we came up with, uh, with some of these important ideas around emotional self-awareness, all of which is relevant to our conversation about, about EQ and coaching. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think, um, you know, our first point here, navigating and leveraging emotions, but what's not said is knowing them first, right? Like knowing them before you can navigate <laughs> them and leverage them. So we sort of, you know, that was our little box. We made an assumption about awareness, but obviously the first thing is to know, the, know your range. And when I'm coaching, it's often the conversation that we're having is for people to in increase their range of understanding what emotions they have. Um, sometimes, particularly men, when I'm coaching men, they think the range is a kind of binary range between happy or sad, angry or calm, uh, and not as much a range because they haven't necessarily been encouraged to develop that range. So part of coaching is to really, um, is, is to have access to a bigger vocabulary and to develop it before you can actually navigate and make use of them in positive ways. I had this client who was convinced there were just two emotions, <laughs> happy and angry that those were his only two emotions <laughs> a very tight binary <laughs> and you know this is we never land that critique on the individual that it's the world that they've been living in either family and or workplaces that haven't created an, an allowance yeah. for building a range mm -hmm. and so you know, people are surprised. It's like, so, so you score high on self-actualization. How do you feel about working in your environment? I love it. I can hardly wait to get up every day. It's like, what are those feelings? Yeah. It's like, oh, I'm excited. It's like, well, that's a feeling. That's what's getting yes. you up and getting you to work. Yeah. So it's easy as a coach to build that awareness, but it is the important place to start before people can see whether they're paying attention to those cues that then they can either leverage in their workplace. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So excitement or enthusiasm about the mission of the organization or yeah. the project or yeah, uh, change, this, transformation. This guy who, who was driven by his to-do list, right. but he never, he never thought about his excitement for checking off right. the things on his to-do list right. as emotional. He thought he, that that was kind of like an Technical. automatic yeah. thing for yeah. him. And yeah. he, he didn't see the connection between emotions and the work that right. he did, but he, but he did acknowledge that he was very motivated, an emotion, to tackle his to-do list every right. day. Yeah, yeah, so as a coach, you really want to, and people do get, well again, excited, it's one emotion, um, about the idea that there's more range that they can develop, and, um, and it's really through practice, but that it's there, mm -hmm. they just haven't had an opportunity necessarily to name it, know it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and this knowing why you react the way you do, mm -hmm. you know, you can go through your hot buttons and take a look at those things that just set you off, you yeah. know, just you know when, when people arrive late for a meeting or, or even too early for a meeting or whatever it is, and just sort of knowing and understanding the way that you operate. Yeah. Yeah. What happens when you get a call from the boss to show up in his office? Are there no emotions involved or is there an emotion or two there? So it's just like, um, like really having people pay attention yes. to that part of their functioning. Yeah, and and when you say pay attention, you know that's it's part of uh, of this uh, of the label for this competency, which is uh, which is awareness, mm -hmm. uh, and um, we we continually say to.
people, you can't change what you're not aware of. And so really one of our central roles as coaches is to raise awareness, help people to come to their own realizations, to come to, to, to sort of those, for those people who are stuck and don't see any options, mm -hmm. for them to mm -hmm. not only uncover one option, but mm -hmm. several options. Mm -hmm. Now, now they've got mm -hmm. th this feeling of em empowerment. It's yeah. overused word, but yeah. it's still accurate. Yeah. Uh, and control. And that's yeah. what we want for people is we want them to have control. Mm -hmm. uh, over their their own lives and and it's understanding how emotions can mm -hmm. affect us mm -hmm. it's a it's a bit of a bigger co conversation but this notion of applying consequential thinking which is where emotions and actions are kind of connected and so seeing how an emotion can lead to a behavior that can lead to the development of a relationship in a different way that can lead to more emotion and so this notion that there's a building up of your own awareness, your awareness of others, and then a deepening of the relationship. So mm -hmm. that's, I mean, there's more to be said about that, but we yeah. won't do that today. Yeah, I just think that that notion of, of consequential thinking is so powerful. Yeah. Some, some people make a decision without any thought as to what's gonna happen next. Right. Yeah. It's like, what are the consequences of yeah. this decision? Who's yeah. it gonna impact? Yeah. How's it gonna impact them? Uh, and they don't think about that, and then, Later on, they try to justify their impact by talking about their intention. That that wasn't that wasn't our intention. Yeah, yeah. And without that emotional awareness, both of yourself and others, you you're just more likely to make mistakes, yeah. particularly as a leader with impacts that you didn't necessarily intend or predict, um, because maybe you're more focused on the technical or the bottom line aspect of, of the yeah. work. We should okay, move, move, move along. Any, any questions on this one? We haven't had any questions yet. We'd love to hear some feedback. Engaging, connecting with others in meaningful ways, predicting your own response, impact on others. Yeah, well, again, just yeah. kind of underscoring the notion of impact. Um, so first, we don't always know the impact that we're having on ourselves by denying us access to our emotions. Yes. Um, and so it shows up in stress, it shows up in short fuse, it shows up mm -hmm. in um, being dull or disconnected. So the impact is first on us and then on others. Yeah. And the positive impact, of course, of building um, a resonance within yourself about your own values and what matters to you and being on purpose. And then it matters because you positively impact rather than yes. And we, we struggled a bit for who we wanted this webinar to be for, whether it was for coaches or for leaders. And then ultimately, there, there should ultimately be very little difference. Mm -hmm. it, it should be that, uh, that, you know, that you are aware of your own emotions uh, when you go into this conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, and as a leader, you know, are you stressed? Are you, are you thinking about something else? Uh, or are you able to show up and be fully present? And, um, yeah, you know, I, I, I took the CTI training over a number of years and recently completed my certification and, uh, and, uh, and I was going, going to do my oral exam. And, and the, the best advice I got was make sure that that examiner, when you're doing your demonstration coaching for your, for your exam, uh, that, that they are the most important person in the room. It's it's not it's not an exam. It's coaching, and it, and they're the center of attention and, and the focus. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I had to forget all about. I had to forget about my nervousness that I was being examined and judged and, and assessed and all those things. Uh, and I had to really self manage. And part of that is this mm -hmm. this emotional mm -hmm. self awareness, mm -hmm. empathy. I, I, I just, I wanted an image of a pair of shoes for this. Uh, can you guess why? Probably you can. Uh, it, putting yourself in someone's shoes, it's an old idea, but it's actually a good idea. Uh, you know, what's it like to be them, to, to be that person? Where are they coming from? Why are they bringing this up? Why are they doing this incorrectly? Why, why are they doing what they're doing? How do we try to understand that? And then this great quote, mm -hmm. and but finders, want, readers. finders, readers. But I do want to say around, um, I think we all have come to realize that we can't exactly walk in another person's shoes. And so it's a close, it's kind of the, the approximation of trying our best to imagine. And what I always say to my clients is, don't leave that thinking inside your own head. Like when you believe you are understanding somebody else, check it out. Make sure that you're um, you're you're in the right ballpark, so that it's not. Well, 
um, because it's, again, um, after this one leader got his EQI results back, he went into the, his next team meeting and he was trying to be empathetic, which wasn't his higher score. And he was looking around and, and this um, team member had a kind of um, non-responsive day and he wasn't responding to this new project that the leader was excited about. And so the leader drew some conclusions. He was trying to be empathetic. So he was thinking about what might be going on for the, the guy but he'd never checked it out. So I said to him, so did you say, uh, what's going on over there? I see that you're kind of withdrawn or quiet right now. It, and that part didn't occur to him to actually check his thought, his thinking out. And so empathy is about really trying hard. He didn't test his reality. He did not test reality. Um, so it's a, and it's a very connected con, um, competency with empathy. But the point is that when we use our own <laughs> we lately heard a metaphor about we're in our own country and if we use our country's rules and currency and ethics to try to figure out somebody else we're likely to be wrong and so we really need to have conversation and be connected so that we can hear what's going on for that other person and in the absence of knowing I think the what we're trying to do is know that that people have things in their lives that we don't aren't always at the surface; they're under the surface. But empathy allows us to recognize that. Yeah. So this um, quote says, "Empathy not only allows great leaders to understand better, I would say, their employees and their customers, but is also known to enhance um, helping behaviors." So when we're when we're in empathy, we're always thinking about how can I be helpful? Yeah. What positive? What impact do I want to have on this relationship or with this person? Um, because of this empathy. It enables leaders to address issues faster and with more precision um, because they're paying attention to the whole context it makes them more flexible but I think again the point for me with empathy is that we're always thinking about what impact we're having um, that, that there's an awareness we don't always we still can't control the impact but with more awareness we're also checking it out and testing it to make mm -hmm. sure that it's the our intention and our impact are connected absolutely yeah yeah yeah, Angela had this great question about uh, from our previous slide, which is about emotional self-awareness. How can leaders role model emotional self-awareness? Uh, so there's two yeah. questions here. The second one is coach their team to 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 improve this. You, you know, one uh, I I, I think I think I might have an answer for both questions, but but okay. but it it's this very simple way that people can start off in this area. Uh, of emotions, uh, and um, uh, and it's just at the start of a of a meeting. Just go around the the room and say, on a scale from one to ten, how are you doing? We haven't said how are you feeling. We haven't said we're going to talk about emotions. We just say from one to ten, how are you doing? Uh, and and that's that's one way that you can begin to do this. And again, we need to begin to do this not by saying, okay, now we're going to sit around and talk about our feelings because that's not going to go well. Uh, but we're going to find ways to talk to, with people in their own language um, uh, about some of these these issues. Mm -hmm. So, and role modeling is is simply. Uh, uh, you, you kind of have to do what's, you know, one of our other competencies, with, with, which is emotional expression to role model um, emotional self-awareness. Which also means using empathy to keep that door open. So if somebody, if an employee comes with a problem, that you also look beyond the problem to the person. How are you doing with it? What's stressing you out the most? Which part might um, be helpful for me to step in and, or, you know, which parts are, are worrying you the most? Where are you most excited in this project? So using your own language of feeling helps other people know that you're paying attention to the whole project, which includes the emotions of the project. Does that, I hope that's helpful. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you did say that's helpful. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for the question. Keep them coming. Yeah. Okay. So we, we, we sorry, did we finish here? Yeah. We, um, uh, your brilliant idea was to come up with some questions around <laughs> empathy. Uh, and so, so um, uh, you know, these are things that you can ask yourself before you go into a coaching session to sort of check the, the empathy box. And so... Or how, a staff meeting or a... Yeah, 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 yeah. anything. Yeah. So how might you adopt your employee's uh, perspective? How might you get into their shoes? How might you try... Uh, to understand where they're coming from. Uh, as Jill mentioned, you, we can't get into their shoes. We, we can't, we're different people, but we can at least try to see it from their perspective. Um, and know that, th know that they're trying. Like, 
sorry, I want you to know that I'm trying to understand yes. your perspective. Yes, yeah. yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. Yeah. So those are the questions that we need to be asking ourselves and others so that we do get their perspective. Mm -hmm. So what were you thinking? What were you thinking when you made that decision? How, uh, or if I sent you in this direction, how would that feel to you? So we're trying to get at both the action part and the, the emotional part. Yeah. Uh, what actions do you take to assist people to feel heard and understood? This is the goal of empathy. When, when people feel like, okay, you get me, then your job is done. And we, we don't get to say whether our job is done. They do. Yeah. So, uh, so again, what are we doing to, uh, to, to try to check in, to say, you know, was that helpful? Did that answer your question? Uh, have I, do you think I've really heard uh, what you're trying to say to me? Yeah. Uh, these kinds of things we, we need to, um, as Jill always says, more information, not less information yeah. when, when communicating. Yeah. Oh, I'm, <laughs> Type typo. What role does empathy play in managing conflict? Any thoughts on this one from the from the group? What role does empathy play in managing conflict? We just thought it was such an important uh, well, connection. Yeah, and try, again, trying to point to where 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 these concepts really are critical in everyday. Looking at the other's perspective. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Mm hmm. Yeah, and so when we go into conflict believing we're right and that we're managing not actually the conflict but managing the other person by suppressing them, then of course we're, we're not in, in I, I don't even like the language of managing conflict, but addressing conflict. We're not really addressing the conflict. We're just trying to win, um, which as a competitor, I think winning is fun, but not, <laughs> not in the workplace. So <laughs> um, yeah, so we're really trying, like it's one useful place to really dial up empathy is in these um, in, where there's potential conflict. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Or emerging conflict. It's actually a way to avoid conflict, but it's useful when, when there is. Um, and also, I mean, just in general, having difficult conversations when you're in empathy rather than in your own perspective, trying to defend your perspective, it just goes way better. You, you're more likely to find a more innovative, creative, yes. collaborative solution yes. than holding two positions and just battling it out yes. until somebody pulls rank. And, and again, this idea that um, uh, that there's just one perspective and it's right. yours and you're right yeah. uh, is incorrect. And so, so use some reality testing and say, okay, so I've, I've got my perspective, they have theirs. How can I more fully understand theirs? Okay, assertiveness. Um, Critical and important piece of, uh, of, of any kind of uh, interpersonal communication uh, and uh, certainly important in coaching. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we need to be able to, um, uh, to call a spade a spade, uh, to use an old expression, which is probably, I, I don't even know where that came from. But, um, uh, but, but it, it's about saying what needs to be said. Uh, and in some cases, that, Right. With empathy, yeah, or or as one of our wonderful coaches, Mike, some of you may know Mike, Mike Walters says, with love in your heart. Right. You know, it, it's like, how can you say this tough thing with love in your heart? Mm -hmm. um, uh, and, um, uh, uh, and certainly what we thought of immediately was this idea of boundaries, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. Brene Brown defines as being able to say what's okay and not okay for you mm -hmm. uh, in, in every relationship. Mm -hmm. And the caveat to boundary setting, uh, some of you might know that I work, have worked for many decades in the area of preventing and uh, supporting women who've experienced abuse and preventing abuse, um, is that boundaries where there's power dynamics, boundaries don't work. So it's, um, you can set a boundary with, with somebody who's working from a more authoritative or hierarchical perspective and it won't matter. So we always wanna make sure that people think they're just not good at setting boundaries. Sometimes the relationship doesn't allow for boundaries. Um, so all of this is, all assertiveness and boundaries is really within the context of people with the same intention of wanting to actually improve the relationship, improve the work culture, et cetera. So yeah, you know, to say what's okay and not okay is central to that to being a sort of, the other side of that is being willing to have difficult conversations. So often I think in the women's leadership courses that I facilitate, women are scoring much higher on assertiveness because they're able to communicate what they need. But when we ask women 
to talk about, are there any um, difficult conversations that they've been avoiding? That's where, I think men and women, but um, for sure in the women's leadership program, that's where we tend to not do what we need to do. And that is have difficult conversations with love in our hearts mm -hmm. because they're more intimidating. People like to be polite. They don't want to have the hard conversations, but avoiding them really, as we well know, gets us into more trouble in the long run. Mm -hmm. So just learn, it's a skill, it's mm -hmm. a skill. Absolutely. Uh, and assertiveness is going to, um, you know, uh, be critical to, uh, for holding people accountable what they said they were going to do. Uh, it's for calling people out when they're at, they're not acting with integrity. Uh, it's, um, uh, it's, it's important that leaders understand how, how critical assertiveness is to their interactions with others and, and to coaching. And, uh, and it's not aggressive. It's not aggression. It, it's, it's balancing the, the needs of the organization, the leader and the employee and making sure that the, that there is an optimal balance between those and and no no one of those parties gets to say how things go mm -hmm. it's got to be a balance mm -hmm. I, I was working with an organization that actually changed the organizational structure because the the um, CEO wasn't wasn't willing to work with one of the program directors so so rather than having a difficult conversation with the program director she just changed the organizational structure to avoid a, a straight line um, <laughs> management between them so that that might be a good example of avoiding being assertive or having a difficult oh, conversation it's so common yeah Jill. so it's so yeah. common so it's not only about calling people like yes. you know I, not that i like that language but it's not only about making sure things get said um in where there's an immediate conflict or problem but it's like this bigger what are we avoiding as an organization yes. or as a person like what can't we be within yes. our lives yes and i think those are the important coaching questions, absolutely right? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Assertiveness is going to allow you uh, with courage to face mm -hmm. what you need to face. And, mm -hmm. and uh, there's a wonderful old saying, you know, that nothing changes without first being faced. Mm -hmm. um, they, mm -hmm. they also go on to say nothing, not everything that gets faced gets, gets changed, right. but, but, yeah. uh, but nothing changes without being, uh, without first being faced. And that's true for us in, in our own lives as well. So, so assertiveness and, and learning to do it well. Uh, and, uh, you know, we have our wonderful model that we teach in our workshops and you, there's lots of great models out there, uh, but it's really important to be able to do it well. Yeah, yeah. To maintain the relationship. Absolutely. Say what needs to be said. With Here's reality testing, which we've been having a lot of fun with and playing around with lately. Mm -hmm. uh, and really, at first, um, I, I don't, don't know that I necessarily realized how important this right. was. Yeah. Uh, because, yeah, 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 we're, we're, we're all realistic, right? Well, no, actually, I knew that I struggled with reality <laughs> testing and that I, you know, would make hasty decisions, letting my optimism carry me through. Uh, but really, when you start thinking about how critical and important this is, is um, uh, you know it, it, it and this quotation kind of says it all one of the biggest challenges in life see things for what they are instead of not what you, instead of what you want them to be and I that's the I, optimism yeah I do that yeah. don't I yeah. yeah I see things for what I want them to be I I see people for who I want them to be and uh, and and you can make mistakes and and mm -hmm. and you and so you have to test your perception uh, and um, uh, the, the, there's a definition there at the bottom, you know, gathering lots of information. Yeah. I think the, the second part, reality testing involves recognizing what role emotions play yes. that might bias our thinking. Absolutely. If we are conflict avoidant people, yeah. <laughs> that's going to, that's going to sort of really distort what we need to do about a relationship. Mm -hmm. Um, etc. Mm -hmm. uh, absolutely. Absolutely. We got it. We have a couple of uh, slides here that, because we're so excited about reality testing. So this, this first one, this is an old, old, um, uh, apparently um, uh, Mahatma Gandhi said this and uh, uh, do you want to read it? Joe? Our beliefs become our thoughts. And so this is very important work in coaching mm. and again, points us towards making sure that when we're working with clients that we have opportunities, we create opportunities to talk about people's beliefs, what are closely held um, beliefs that matter and, and really shape and drive people. So our beliefs become our thoughts, our thoughts become our words, our words become our habits, our habits become our values, and our values become our destiny. 
And so I think what, again, what we're, what we're showing is that, that to, to, to me, um, I always say I was born with the fairness gene or an equality gene. And so I've been a feminist for a long time, but that's my, that's my, I know that to be a value, but what, it's important to track it back. And it's like, what needs to be changed? What needs to be refreshed? What, what else do I need to know? Um, so that, that may be, you know, kind of maintains relevance and matters to other people as well. How does that bias your decisions? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> and this can possibly lead to perception errors. Mm -hmm. uh, and so here's a critical and important question. How have your beliefs limited and or enabled your development as a leader? Uh, and of course, this is just one example of many, many questions we need to ask ourselves mm -hmm. around, uh, around whether we are um, you know, seeing things the way we need to be seeing them in order to serve us and our organization and our employees. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so this whole idea of bias comes in, uh, and this, this whole area of implicit bias or unconscious bias is really, yeah, conformity bias, like, all oh, well, those are individual another, separate yeah, yeah, right. errors that yeah. we make yeah. in our perceptions. Yeah. And in fact, there are 117 of them, according to Wikipedia. <laughs> uh, and these are just two of them. One is perception error uh, about how beliefs kind of bias us in our views. And the other one is attribution error. Mm -hmm. And powerful, powerful. Yeah. Like, we can all think of a time that we've given an attribution as a sociologist by training. We, we know we need those categories to put people in. So it's not that we think we can get rid of all categories. It helps us function. But within that, we make lots of errors because we attribute motives in particular to people's behaviors when we, or even just who they are by race or by gender. Yeah. We begin at our attribution and then we start a story about that person. And without reality testing, we hold our story as truth rather than Yes. as a perspective that needs to be tested out. Um, and so again, some of the actions with, some, with any, in any coaching, but what do you need to do to check out your perceptions? Yeah. Like who do you need to check with? Who are the right people at the right times? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and yeah, and, and like, the, like the workshop exercise where you've, we've got these photographs on one side and then a story on the other, and, but you try to tell the story just from the photograph, and um, uh, and it's it's uh, surprising how incorrect, off track, mm -hmm. or or probably more even more correct to say is that those stories align with the beliefs we right. have about certain images. Mm -hmm. uh, so in the absence of other information, mm -hmm. our brains make up information, mm -hmm. and it's important to understand what's made up and what's real. Right. Right. Yeah, so powerful, powerful stuff, this, um, this attribution error stuff. Uh, and, um, and then we, we just quickly, just quickly <laughs> we'll do this part, right? So, so very quickly, uh, we, Jill and I both love um, CTI, that's the Coactive Training Institute's ideas around authentic expression. Uh, and, uh, and this is important for coaches because it's you as the coach who are going to be um, sort of going into this conversation and approaching this conversation uh, and then to understand this in terms of, of what it does for others. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I love the image. Mm -hmm. Martin Luther King Jr., Wow, talk about fierce courage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So again, it's like, how do we translate that? I think Angela's question was, was kind of getting us to think about that. Like, what does it actually look like? Yes. Um, what actions um, do you model? And so one of them is fierce courage, being able to speak with heart about the things that matter. So boldly standing. Um, I think often, one of the other competencies in the EQI is independence and, and um, independence not being opposite to team, but independence of thought in particular. So that when we have a thought that we stand for it, that we share it, we stand for it, we are prepared to explain it, we're also prepared to change um, and we're willing to take a risk. So it's not only about relationship, it's also about innovation and other ones of the leadership dimensions. But again, it's truth from the heart. And that can't be made wrong when you speak the truth from your heart. Absolutely. But we are really discouraged in general from speaking from the heart. 
um, in workplaces. Absolutely. <laughs> aliveness. <laughs> the, this the aliveness is uh, is is really fantastic, uh, uh, and uh, you might think, okay, so I'm an introvert. I, you know, I. You know, I'm not Tigger, right? I, I, I don't bounce off the walls and, uh, and uh, I, don't, I don't think you need to be no. an extrovert to no. demonstrate this, you know? No. It, really is, uh, it really is just that vitality. Passion, that, right? Passion, I always think of. Yeah, and, and again, it's why self-actualization is so critical and important in all the dimensions of leadership. It's like, are you doing what you love? And if you're and doing do what you love, yeah. Do people know it? Do yeah. you demonstrate it in what yeah. you do? Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I, I hope that you know how much um, Jill and I love this and, and get excited about this topic because um, um, I, th that's, that's what we're trying to, we're, what we're trying to, you know, draw your attention to this quality. But if you're, if you're not alive, why would I pay attention? If, if I didn't know that you were passionate about it, why would I follow you? Why would I follow you with enthusiasm, with, with give you my discretionary effort and, uh, and all of those things? Uh, and so, so uh, Jill was telling me about this, you know, okay, so, so if it's on a scale, if aliveness is on a scale from one to, or zero to 10, who's zero? And uh, so we came up, well, you, you yeah, gave Eeyore, yeah. e, the idea of Eeyore. And so who's 10? Well, that's got to be Tigger. <laughs> so, uh, so that's why we've got Tigger and Eeyore there. So the first one is fierce courage. The second one is aliveness. And, you know, people might think, how do you coach Eeyore? Yeah, right? like absolutely. That's, yeah, yeah. And, and then, so you ask yourself as a coach, what kind of energy do I need to bring in to a coaching session with an Eeyore? And by Eeyore, we're like, you know, what that means is, not today, I'm not ready for that, or that's too much. So that energy is really hard to be around. And part of the coach's job is to get really organized, personally organized and connected to your own passion and vitality to bring that. And then the coaching is the inspiration to, what would it take to move from zero to two? Like what would two look like in your life? Yes. So that kind of idea in coaching is yeah. bringing people and Tigger, you know, if you're a Tigger, you might want to be coaching down a little, like 10 isn't always the aspirational goal either. So it's like, what impact does Tigger have on the world? Most of it's positive, but maybe as a leader you've got, so you get the sense of the coaching. Could, could be annoying. Around that. It could be annoying. <laughs> <laughs> and I just had a coaching client recently, very, very negative. But he didn't, he, but you know, when, when I challenged him on it, he, he thought he didn't sort of portray that out. Right, right. But, you know, I got to question that. I, I you know. But that's it. If you feel it, you if, can say that to them, right? He might think he's not right. letting people know how negative he views the world and everything, but I think it's got to kind of leak out. Yeah, emotional self-awareness and yeah. Yeah, expression and impact. The, the third one is connection. Uh, and uh, why don't you speak to connection? Because this is... Uh... Well, we couldn't think of anybody more <laughs> disconnected than someone who's always armored up. Yeah. Right? Who's got lots of insulation between their emotions and their, their relationships. Um, what, whether it's the mask that you wear, or the armor that you put on to go to work, or how, whatever it is. So that's the zero. And then Oprah, we were just thinking about, you know, how she shows up in the world in her aliveness, in her connection with, yeah. with really important social yeah. world issues and how she speaks boldly and courageously about all of that. So, you know, we're not... We're not here, promoting Oprah, but I think she stands for something. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we could have put Barack Obama on there, but you know, it's a contentious time. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, but really, the connection is the most basic and powerful way to connect to another person is to listen. This is how we started at the beginning yes. with this quote, yeah. and we're kind of ending here again. It's about paying attention, and that's the that we can only connect when we're paying attention when we give people the gift of of our attention. Uh, question, Angela, thank you. Does being interested and curious play a role here? Uh, I'm not sure which here you're talking about, but, but of course, uh, being interested and, and curious is a critical and important piece of coaching. Mm -hmm. uh, we frequently talk about it when, when we uh, teach our certification course and teach people how to review or debrief EQI results. Um, being curious, um, you know, we're, we're not there to tell people what to do. Or what, to, their, what their results mean or anything. We yeah. want to raise awareness 
so we're curious and we're kind of role modeling the curiosity. Mm -hmm. We want them to be curious about their own, uh, their own EQ. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, yeah, in my early, in the early development, as I was starting to learn how to use the EQI, I would read through, I would ask David, like, what does this mean? What does this mean? And I, I don't do that at all anymore. I just go in with curiosity and a trust that people will make sense of the, those scores for them. And it's just such a more rich and interesting conversation to allow that space for people to really tell themselves yeah. what it means to them and make sense of it. And I'm just there to guide the conversation. So, so Angela uh, clarified her question a bit and okay. said with improving connection. And, oh, okay. and, and I think absolutely, yeah. Angela, I think, you know, if you think about what the opposite of curiosity is, it's judgment. Right, so so um, and and judgment just uh, per, sort of limits or or kind of prevents uh, connection. Kind well, of. I mean disconnection and disconnection can disconnects be, yeah. people. Yeah, so judgment can disconnect. Yes. Other things can disconnect yes. as well. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Great question. Thank you. Okay, so that's what we wanted to tell you today, uh, and um, uh, so now, now's the time, uh, you know, we got a few minutes if you got questions about what we've just presented here, uh, and again, how to stay connected to heart. Well, what we mean by that, it's code, right? Uh, connecting with heart is code for, for staying in touch with your emotions by uh, allowing that awareness to guide you, to direct you, to say, you know what, now's not a good time for a coaching session because I, I'm, I, you know, I'm, I'm upset, I'm stressed, I'm worried, I'm angry about something else that's happened. Uh, so so uh, the, it, it's going to give you that information that mm -hmm. you need. Which is really, we didn't really use the language fully, but we talk about uh, um, our emotions as data. So when we ignore our emotions, or um, we really are ignoring important, critical data, because it's going to run the show whether we're paying attention to it or not. Our emotions can really run the show. So the more, back to some of our earlier comments, the more we're aware of our emotions, the more we leverage them in the right ways, because it's data. We don't, there's really in our workplaces, we, be in hot water if we ignore data that was important and mm -hmm. so we're saying to you this is important data that needs to be integrated leveraged and used appropriately because it's going to manage it's going to run the show if you're not paying attention to your emotional state mm -hmm. absolutely so we've got uh it's been awesome all kinds of new deep aspects to consider from today thanks kim that's a nice nice feedback uh yeah we're going to see the dates for the refresher for those who previously taken the course this um Question. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, but I just want to answer Carolyn's question quickly. Um, uh, Carolyn, we will send you the link to the refresher uh, for the CERT course. It, it, we offered a very, very low cost. We love having people come back, alumni come back and take the course. They add so much to the group. Uh, and there, there is a cost, very low cost. Uh, say, uh, question from Kim. Uh, go ahead. I love that positioning that emotions are data it may be very helpful in conversations that have some deep fear around letting emotions out in the workplace, you're absolutely right. That is, it is the most helpful way to reach people who are who have just had deep training around emotions don't belong at work. Yeah. And like, it's data, it's operating in there. How many times has one of your moods or your feelings run um, a conversation or a reaction? So the more you know about it, the better the data. So thanks for taking yeah. note of that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, with CEOs, with boards of directors, you know how badly those relationships can occasionally be. And when you go in angry with the board because of their, like, yeah. without realizing that you're all on the same team, yeah. that, that you're, that you're actually a team working together, that, 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 that well, even naming the anger, right? Yeah. Like even just naming the anger and, and really probably what it is is some value got crossed yeah. that nobody's talking about. And so being able to name that, like I'm mad because like this important value of community or social responsibility mm -hmm. got crossed today for me. And I just need a minute to talk about that yeah. because it's important in the organization. So yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I want to make a pitch for Heart and Science. For oh, Leadership please for women. do, do, do. Ottawa next week and then um, Vancouver, Vancouver in November. So join us. Yeah. Three yeah. days with uh, women only. It's a three day leadership course. Um, we use the EQI leadership report and it's just fabulous. Yeah. Uh, uh, do you have tips for dealing with leaders who do begin or start from an armored place 
or that formal mm. untouchable internal version of themselves. Absolutely. You know, yeah. I mean, the EQI is a good place to start because it's a good conversation, but it's systematic, that, it's scientific, right. it's but kind of... In the absence of that, I think, you know, it's just these kind of subtle questions, like, is there an emotional part to that? Or what's the value behind that that matters to you? Or where are we coming from when we're thinking about that? Or, um, you know, like I've been saying to the guys, just like the, the, all these managers, leaders that we've been working with lately, really so there's no emotion there when you're talking to that employee and they're like mm, yeah there is so just start your own in your own way i just want to get to this last question okay if boundaries don't work when there is a power imbalance yeah. how do people develop boundaries or what should they do in that situation mm -hmm. we hate to tell people to leave an organization but <laughs> <laughs> you know power is power right and you can, you know the idea of speaking truth to power is actually sometimes quite dangerous so um know know your own relationship to that power um, whether it's safe or not. I think developing insulation um, is one way of doing it. Um, but I think, I don't know, for me, when you can't set a boundary for yourself because of the power dynamic, I, I'd be coaching a person, not the problem on that one. I would be saying like, really, is this a place that you need to be? If, if, there, if that's a dynamic that is probably not changing, um, the only change possible is what you do around that. It's a complicated question. Mm -hmm. Happy to have more conversation. There, there, offline with you. Yeah, there are extreme situations, abuse, uh, bullying, uh, areas where, you know, we, we don't want to send people. Uh, yeah. You know, we, we, we really want to, you yeah. know, work with them. Yeah, power is power is so true. Yeah. And I think that's the thing. Um, if you're an optimist, I think sometimes you keep going in thinking, believing you have, um, there is room for change. And sometimes it's just important to say the reality is this is a person who's more interested in power than they are in relationship. Um, and you want to test that out before you make that final conclusion. Um, but yeah, power, when power is power, um, that's not going to change. Yeah. And I just want to make a pitch for the EQ Essentials for Leadership program. Right. This is a two day uh, course where we dive deep into the four dimensional model of transformational leadership, just, just like Joel does in the, in the heart and science of leadership for women. Well, this we're is doing a, that course together in November. We right? are, we yeah. are, we are. Yeah. So the EQ Essentials for Leadership is two days. Uh, it's a course that we designed for organizations. We go into organizations and, and offer this course. We've decided to offer it publicly. And so we've got one coming up in Vancouver. Uh, this fall I think that's it for this year mm -hmm. uh, and uh, our 2020 dates are going to be coming out very very soon uh, thanks thank you so much for joining us today we appreciate the great feedback and love to stay in touch and hear from all of you so so please uh, you know uh, subscribe with us and uh, hope to see you on uh, in on future webinars great bye bye thanks everybody <laughs>